Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar entitled New Paradigms in Understanding PCOS, Impact of the Microbiome. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Felice Gersh. My name is Michael Chapman, and I'm a medical education specialist at Genova's Asheville branch, and I'm going to serve as moderator for today's webinar. We would like to welcome Dr. Felice Gersh. Dr. Gersh has led a distinguished career serving the community in many varied roles. She founded one of the most successful private practices in Orange, Orange County, California, the Integrative Medical Group of Irvine, and continues to be its medical director. As an assistant clinical professor of OBGYN at Keck USC School of Medicine, she taught medical students and residents and has also been a frequent guest lecturer at the University of California, Irvine, Paul Mirage School of Business, and the UCI Medical School. Her other roles have included consulting and lecturing on behalf of pharmaceutical and laboratory testing companies, lecturing to community physicians at medical grand rounds and at major medical conferences, and serving on several medical advisory boards. Additionally, Dr. Gersh is an expert reviewer for the Medical Board of California. Now I'm going to turn over controls to you, Dr. Gersh, and uh, thank you all for being here. And you should have thank you. controls. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and for inviting me here to discuss a topic that I feel so passionately about, and I hope by the end of this um, little presentation that you'll feel the same way. Before we begin, I'd like you to just imagine the following. Imagine you're a 22-year-old young woman recently graduated from college. You're starting your life. You're embarking on your future. You wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror. And what do you see? You see a face that's covered, especially the lower half, with pustules and cysts. You see discolorations and acne scars. You see hair at the top of your head thinning. You see a body that is about 30, 40 pounds overweight. You worry about what's going to happen today. Are you going to have cramps because you have irritable bowel syndrome? You feel vaguely anxious. You didn't get a very good night's sleep. And you wonder if you're going to you know, experience any happiness in your life. Sadly, this is the face of most women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. But now we're going to discuss all kinds of new ideas and ways that using food as medicine, you can modify the microbiome to actually change the future of these young women. So we're going to cover a variety of very important objectives this morning, or this afternoon, wherever you are in the country right now. We're going to talk about the gut microbiome that amazing new discovery that really is critical to the health of every part of every person, and especially in women with PCOS. We're going to talk about how an unhealthy gut microbiome can develop and how it can really dramatically impact on the health of these women. We'll talk about some of the very critical laboratory tests that you should access to help evaluate the gut microbiome in these women, and then we're going to give you wonderful new options using nutrients, using food as medicine to help reestablish a healthy gut microbiome and restore metabolic homeostasis through these dietary sources. I'm sure you're all familiar with the title that's given to this condition, polycystic ovary syndrome, referred to often as PCOS. Initially, this was thought to be just a hormonal disorder becoming obvious after puberty. But in fact, it's actually so much more than that, which we're going to go over in just the next few minutes. The name polycystic ovary syndrome came about because of the findings of these numerous small cysts around the outer edge of the ovary. And this is representative of the really major dysfunction that occurs in the ovaries of these women that does not allow them to have proper function and ovulation. PCOS is not just a problem within the U.S. In fact, I was just a few months ago 
at a PCOS conference that was held in Australia. And there were people there, academics from everywhere in the world. There were people from you know, North Africa. There were people from Asia, from North and South America. PCOS is now a worldwide epidemic. It's actually in involving women everywhere. It's the most common endocrine dysfunction of women. That's why it's so critical that you become very familiar with this condition and how to help your women patients with this condition. In fact, a very high percentage of women with PCOS remain undiagnosed or improperly diagnosed and treated for many, many years. The incidence is variable depending on who you ask, but it's somewhere in the 10 to 20% of all women, and some say it's actually already up to 25% of women. The vast majority are overweight or obese, but some are actually lean or normal weight, but they are the, major they are the minority. The women who are obese with PCOS not only have all the manifestations of PCOS, which we're going to review in a few moments, but they have the extra burden of the issues, the metabolic issues that are associated with obesity. PCOS is actually a lifelong condition. It doesn't dissipate at menopause, although some of the symptoms do, but the metabolic dysfunctions, the underlying things that are going on in the woman are still going on after menopause. And in fact, we now know that women who develop PCOS are actually born with that predisposition. And you can actually do testing when they're children, like at the age of six or seven, you can test a, a lab test called adiponectin and actually predict and take steps to avert some of the most terrible manifestations of PCOS, including using diet, which we're going to be talking about during this, this time. Women with PCOS not only have risk for themselves, it turns out that their first degree relatives also carry a significant risk. And in fact, the mothers of women with PCOS have about a 60% higher risk of developing diabetes themselves. So this is a family condition. I put up this slide to show you that Unlike what I was taught when I was in medical school and residency, that PCOS is a hormonal problem. It is a hormonal problem, but it is so much more than that. It involves every metabolic process in the female body. So this shows that you're involving the fat tissue, and that's why I mentioned the hormone, the adipokine, adiponectin. That is a hormone that is very important for metabolic functions. It helps to create more uh, appropriate glucose transport and fat burning. And that hormone is in low supply in women with PCOS. And so those functions do not occur properly. The liver is involved. And fatty liver is very, very common with, in women with PCOS. Of course, insulin signaling is abnormal. There's a high incidence of insulin resistance. There's insulin resistance in the muscle as well. And of course, the entire um, access involving the pituitary, the adrenal, the ovary is all dysregulated. You often will get low levels of FSH, high levels of LH, creating tremendous imbalances within these systems. Women with PCOS tend to have upregulated adrenal function. They have high sympathetic tone, which gives them more anxiety and sleep disorders. And in fact, they often have flipped circadian rhythm, where their cortisol is actually highest at night and lowest in the morning. That's why they have many, many sleep dysfunctions. So PCOS involves the hormonal and reproduction aspects of women. And look at this array. It's You can just see how how sad any woman with PCOS would feel. Acne, hirsutism, alopecia. They have ovulation problems, irregular cycles. This leads to infertility. And the lucky ones who get pregnant will often have high rates of pregnancy complications. They often get gestational diabetes, premature labor and delivery, and preeclampsia. You think with the high levels of androgens, they have high levels of androgens. That's a hallmark thing that occurs in women with PCOS that they would have high levels of libido, but in fact, it's the opposite. They have low levels of libido. And this is something that is very important. I want you to all know that they have abnormal hormone receptors. This is very new information. Women with PCOS, their 
estrogen receptors are malfunctioning and probably their melatonin receptors are malfunctioning. And this goes to the etiology, which we're also going to explore, that the etiology of PCOS is complex, but it involves in utero exposures to endocrine disruptors, which cause the hormonal receptors, particularly estrogen receptors, to not develop normally. So this creates a lot of the hormonal and metabolic chaos that these women experience. And look at some of the metabolic chaos that these women have to endure. They have insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, they develop central obesity and overweight. Because their estrogen receptors are not functioning properly, their endothelium of their arteries are not functioning properly. They don't have proper production of nitric oxide and they develop early aged onset of hypertension and as I mentioned, fatty liver and insulin resistance. And that's not all. They also have higher rates of autoimmune disease, particularly Hashimoto's autoimmune thyroid. They develop a lot of GI problems. Estrogen receptors reside in the gut. This is another very important and new piece of information. And because of this malfunction, they also have higher rates of irritable bowel syndrome and leaky gut or impaired gut permeability, which we'll discuss further. They're inflamed. They have just systemic inflammation. They're more likely to have arthritis and tendinitis. And as I mentioned, mood disorders. They have more vaginal infections, especially yeast infections. But not only that, they also get more bacterial infections because they have dysbiosis of their vaginal flora as well. Sleep dysfunction because they have flipped circadian rhythm and Obstructive sleep apnea is very common. They have higher rates of cancers, particularly endometrial cancers. And they, this is also not well understood or recognized, but they have higher rates of fibroids and endometriosis. So as I mentioned, inflammation is the driving force. These women are inflamed. I view them as on fire. They have all of these functions abnormally working in their bodies. And inflammation is universal in women with PCOS. And where does this inflammation come from? Why do they have this inflammation? It turns out that the immune system also has receptors to estrogen. And the macrophages, which reside in the gut-associated lymphatic tissue, the immune system that surrounds the gut, has activated, like preloaded macrophages, which have the cytokines. And just a little bit, much less than what would it, it would take in another healthy person, a little bit of passage of lipopolysaccharides, those endotoxins that are formed by dysbiotic gut bacteria, the bad bacteria that, that produce these little particles and then pass through the endothelial lining of the gut, the leaky gut problem that we mentioned, that these macrophages are loaded, ready to fire out cytokines. And so they are pre-activated. These studies have been published that show that the macrophages are different in women with PCOS. They're more prone to releasing their inflammatory cytokines. And if you set the scene with a dysbiotic gut, you're going to have an explosion of inflammation. So I briefly touched on the etiology of PCOS, and this is controversial, but it does involve in utero exposures to endocrine disruptors, particularly the focus has been on bisphenol A, creating oxidative stress in utero, predisposing to obesity and insulin resistance, and then you add on a leaky gut and dysbiotic gut and abnormal gut microbiome, and you have set the stage for everything that occurs that is unwanted and really catastrophic for so many women with PCOS. So let's talk about the gut, that amazing gut microbiome, which we now have learned is so pivotal to maintain local and systemic homeostasis. 
we have new ideas about what does it mean to be a human. We're, when we look in the mirror, we're not quite what we see because, in fact, we're this amazing symbiotic combination of our own genes, the genes of our microbiome, and we now know the microbiome of the gut impacts every biological system in the body. You name it, the gut microbiome is on it. So we are actually a super organism. Our bodies are just amazing with the way that we work with our microbes. And they may outnumber us dramatically, but maybe not. Actually, this is all quite controversial right now. But what we do know is that this incredible ecosystem consisting of hundreds of different bacterial species is essential to the function of our bodies. Here's just an array of all the different functions that the microbiome are involved with. And this is just a fraction, really. You could do an hour lecture on each one of these. And of course, we don't have time for that. But I want you to realize the amazing diversity of functions that the microbiome is involved with. And let's focus a little bit on the immune system, the neurological system. Those are really key areas that are involved with PCOS. And of course, fat is very key to um, PCOS and the abnormalities involving the adipokines. But just Every one of these things has an involvement with PCOS and with all of us, of course. I wanted to touch on the role of short-chain fatty acids. They are involved with many, many functions in the body. They actually can circulate and impact on brain health. The immune system, which is now recognized to be very key and links the gut microbiome, the brain, the metabolic functions of the body, is really very involved with short-chain fatty acids. And this is very important. If you do not produce short-chain fatty acids properly, you will develop a dysregulation of your immune system. And this occurs in women with PCOS. This is just a quick overview, just to give you an idea of the complexity of the world of the gut. As you can see, you have the microbes, and then you have the food interacting with the microbes to create these metabolites. If you look at this pretty slide, at the top, you see a healthy microbiome and a healthy gut, where you have this gray area that's attached to the enterocytes. And that is the mucus layer, the protectant layer. But as you go down towards the bottom, you see an unhealthy area where you do not have that protectant mucus coating. And you have fewer metabolites, different metabolites. And you're going to have impaired gut barrier function. See, it says compromise of the gut barrier. And this is what happens in women with PCOS. As you see on the other side, of the lumen of the intestinal tract, you have the intestinal tract's immune system, the gut-associated lymphatic system. And there you see at the top, it says lymphoid follicles. Those are Peyer's patches. Those are filled with T cells and lymphocytes of other sorts and also macrophages. And these aspects of the immune system are very key in, in signaling to the brain and other parts of the body. And these cells all have estrogen receptors, which are malfunctioning in women with PCOS. So the signals are wrong. Remember, these are the cells that put out the inflammatory cytokines when they're faced with lipopolysaccharides. So this just gives you a very ov brief overview of the complexity of what is going on in the gut involving the immune system. So here it shows a little bit more some of the interactions with the microbiome and the production of short-chain fatty acids. I just wanted you to realize that there's so much going on here. You see, if someone eats fiber, it alters the interactions with the bacteria, and the bacteria can produce short-chain fatty acids, acetate, butyrate, and propionate. The butyrate is actually food for the enterocytes, the lining cells of the intestinal tract. The acetate and propionate also travel to the liver and through complex mechanisms, they actually work with the brain through the, the nerves that are in the portal vein, and they signal to the brain. The brain signals back. You can see that it's a bi-directional system, and it causes the 
endoenterocyte, the endocrine producing enterocytes of the lining of the intestinal tract to produce glucose. This is called intestinal glucose gluconeogenesis. And these are critical signals that allow the body to regulate appetite and metabolic homeostasis. But when you have abnormal bacteria, you don't have the right production of the short chain fatty acids, this entire signaling apparatus becomes dysfunctional. And this also occurs in women with polycystic ovary syndrome, which gives them poorly regulated appetite and metabolic control. So as we mentioned, there are so many aspects to the microbiome and how it develops. It relates to how a person is born, whether they're C-section or vaginal delivery, the diet, the medications that they're exposed to, what happens with their, their um, toxins, you know, like things like Roundup and glyphosate can have a big impact, things like artificial sweeteners and emotional stress, sleep and such frequency of eating. And then I wanted to just make sure I emphasized hormones. I call that the forgotten piece of the influence on the microbiome, particularly estrogen. But actually, we now know that melatonin actually has a role. And we know that when you have proper melatonin production, it can actually cause swarming of certain bacteria at night, which then signal other bacteria. So it's so complex. And one of the problems with women with PCOS is that they also seem to have melatonin receptor problems and poor sleep, and this also impacts on their microbiome as well. This is some really critical information that we now know that confirmed we have studies that are published that show that women with PCOS actually have dysfunctional abnormal estrogen receptor function. The primary estrogen receptor of the enterocytes, of the gut lining cells, is the estrogen receptor beta. There's another one that's called alpha. And it's found that they're both impacted, that there are lower receptor function for beta and alpha in women with PCOS. This is a huge development that we now know that a lot of what is happening in women with PCOS relates to abnormal estrogen receptor function. So we need to look at a whole different way of viewing what is obesity and how women develop obesity. For example, women with PCOS may have a very small intake of calories. It's not just about caloric intake. In fact, the gut microbiota, now we know, are different in women with PCOS. We finally have our theories have been proven. Women with PCOS are not the same as other women. And this has been previously shown in people with type 2 diabetes. They have dysbiosis. They have different gut microbiomes. And this has been shown in rodents, where they've done studies where they've transplanted different fecal microbiomes to cloned rodents and found that just by changing the microbiota, they can change their weight and their metabolic status. Even when they're cloned, they have the same genetic material, they actually are given exactly the same food and the same environment. Just changing the gut microbiota can change your metabolic functions and your weight. We know that the diet that many people eat now, all around the world, which is called often the Western diet or SAD, the standard American diet, leads to what is called endotoxemia. Toxins develop from within. These are the systemic manifestations of lipopolysaccharides, those little particles that come from the abnormal bacteria that overgrow in the guts of people with a dysfunctional microbiome. And a high-fat, high-simple-carbohydrate meal will create endotoxemia and systemic inflammation by inducing gut barrier-impaired function leaky gut, and this, these lipopolysaccharides attach to toll-like receptors that are present in the enteroneurologic um, system. The neurologic system that surrounds the gut has toll-like receptors. These are, by the way, estrogen receptor-related functions, and these toll-like receptors then create more inflammatory cytokine production by calling out 
the macrophages and such to swarm and then produce these cytokines. They also produce proteins that interfere with insulin signaling production. So the standard American diet is incredibly toxic, and especially to women with PCOS. This is an overview of what happens when you have dysbiosis. You get, see the flame, that gut inflammation? There are so many things that can trigger this, artificial sweeteners and sugar. As far as red meat goes, if you eat even healthy grass-fed meat, but you have a dysbiotic gut, you will make metabolic byproducts like TMAO, which are both markers of problems as far as cardiovascular health, but are toxins in and of themselves, which is why I recommend, which I'm going to go over, you start off with a vegan diet for people with severe dysbiosis because they don't have the right gut bacteria to actually process animal products like meat and eggs. That will come later after you reestablish a healthy gut bacterial environment. But things like phytonutrients, like from the healthy apple, that can help block dysbiosis, as can omega-3 from wild salmon. But once again, I prefer to use omega-3 supplements and not have the fish eaten until after we reestablish a healthy gut microbiome. And as you can see at the bottom of the slide, all the negative things that occur when you have leaky gut and systemic endotoxemia with the lipopolysaccharide circulating, you can get cancer, you can get autoimmunity and systemic inflammation, metabolic chaos. So here is a wonderful overview that was written up by my friend, um, Professor Tremelin, who's in Australia. And he actually proposed this back in 2012, and now it's been proven that this is indeed what happens. You eat the standard American diet, the French fries, the sugary soda, and so on. It creates a leaky gut. You lose your nice mucus protectant, and you can see on the bottom there on the right, you have a leaky gut. You have the lipopolysaccharides passing through, activating the macrophages, which create that inflammatory state. All those inflammatory cytokines are circulating, which then go to the liver, with, and it incites inflammation in the liver, which creates insulin resistance. Insulin circulates at higher levels. This creates higher levels of IGF-1, which drives testosterone production. As well, the lipopolysaccharides are, and the endotoxins are actually toxic directly to the oocytes of the ovary. These work together to impair follicle development. You do not have ovulation. You have higher and higher levels of testosterone. Because of this receptor problem and malfunctioning of estrogen within the ovary itself, you do not have proper aromatization. Testosterone is not turned into estrogen properly. The brain perceives that there's not enough estrogen circulating. It puts out higher and higher levels of LH, driving more testosterone production. And so you have this horrible situation where you have more and more testosterone, acne, hirsutism, impaired ovulation, and metabolic dysfunction. But there is hope because by giving the proper diet, probiotics, prebiotics, you can help to restore the mucus. You can help to restore a healthy gut and seal those holes in the leaky gut, restore proper microbiota, and then you get the enterocytes producing their proper hormones like the GLP-1, which helps the brain to have proper control of appetite, you reduce systemic inflammation, you lower testosterone production, and you can return hormonal function and ovulation to normal. And in fact, by doing all of the things that I do, I can restore ovulation in virtually all of my patients with PCOS. This is, it sounds so terrible, but honestly, you can really, really help these women. And it doesn't take pharmaceuticals. You can do it with diet and lifestyle changes. We now know that the gut is different in PCOS from several studies that have been published. In fact, one just uh, last month. This particular study looks at LPB, that's lipopolysaccharide binding protein, which correlates with lipopolysaccharides. And they found in both lean and obese patients with PCOS that there were indeed higher levels of these binding proteins in implying very 
clearly that there are higher levels of lipopolysaccharides circulating in women with PCOS when you compare them with control women at the same weights. Women with, with PCOS are indeed different. This particular study, which was just published, showed that there was altered Archimansia um, mucinia. That is the bacteria that is heavily responsible for the production of the mucus protectant layer. And there were reduced levels of these bacteria in women with PCOS. As well, they had reduced gut microbiome diversity. And because they had different bacteria, they had reduced production of serotonin. That's one of the things that is so amazing. The gut bacteria actually produce neurotransmitters. I mean, this is some of the most amazing information that we're learning about our gut microbiome. And these productions are reduced in women with PCOS, which of course has a big impact both on their mood and on the function of the gut, which is why another reason why they have higher rates of irritable bowel syndrome. And they also showed higher rates of lipopolysaccharides in the production of the bacteria of women with PCOS. This particular study also confirmed that women with PCOS have an altered gut microbiome and that they have higher rates of endotoxemia. In a rat model of PCOS, they showed that by doing fecal transplants of healthy microbiota, they could actually see improvement in the symptoms of the rats. And that's sort of the whole foundation of my treatment, is to alter the microbiome and alter all of the downstream effects of a healthier microbiome that that will provide. So here is my treatment. I call it food is medicine. Food is so much more than just macronutrients and calories. Food provides information to our cells. It is actually functioning as a hormone, and it nourishes our microbiome, which has not been recognized. In fact, I think we have done everything that is humanly possible to kill, destroy, starve, and maim our gut microbiota. But all of that can change. It can change by just putting different food in the refrigerator and on the plate. And we can alter the microbiome and alter the course of the lives of these women afflicted with PCOS. So here is wonderful food. How much better is that than opening up a pill bottle? This is the future for women with PCOS, is changing their diet. So food is information. Food Actually, as I showed you in an earlier slide, food can react with the microbiota to create metabolites. And these metabolites can travel through the, between the enterocytes. This is appropriate. They're supposed to. That's why it's not an impenetrable barrier. It's a controlled barrier. And it's when it gets out of control and it becomes completely leaky, that's when we're in trouble. But when it's controlled and the appropriate metabolites pass through and get into the immune system and circulate through the body, you get exactly what you're supposed to get, the appropriate interaction between our cells and the metabolites produced from our food with our gut microbiome. And this creates information to the cells that allows the cells to do its proper functions. So it's really quite amazing, and I call them like the miracles, the polyphenols of food that can actually interact to create amazing signals with our cells and bind to receptors and enable our cells to function as they were designed to function. So food actually can also be looked at as a hormone. Isn't that amazing that we now know that food, that the metabolites and the polyphenols can actually react with the membrane receptors and nuclear receptors to regulate metabolic health. So food really is my prescription. And we must feed our microbiome. We cannot starve them. It turns out that many, many years ago, in more primitive societies, humans consumed between 100 and 150 grams of fiber a day. A typical American may consume like 10 I mean, they have the goal to eat 25 grams of fiber but, fiber, but in reality, our bodies were designed for enormous amounts of fiber, and 
that's why we have this epidemic of constipation, among other issues, because we do not consume the right food to feed our microbiota. And this can be fixed, you know, by eating a diet that's rich in fiber and prebiotics, which are the specific fibers that feed our good bacteria, and probiotic food, fermented foods, that also help to stimulate the healthy reproduction and flourishing of our healthy microbiota. So we know that a high, a high fat, high sugar diet is terrible. But if you take a lower fat, not no fat, okay, fat is critical, we're going to talk about that, but a lower fat diet with a very high complex carbohydrate composition, you can really alter metabolic syndrome. In fact, there are studies that show that in just one month of eating this diet, you can reverse many, many, many of the features of metabolic syndrome. You can alter the microbiota by increasing certain types of bacteria that will increase the production of that amazing short-chain fatty acid, butyrate. Butyrate actually helps to seal leaky gut. So by changing your diet and your PCOS patients, you can actually help them to seal their leaky gut. So what about some foods like phytoestrogen foods? I used to be against soy, but now that I understand how soy can relate with the microbiome, I am pro-soy, but it has to be organic. Soy is one of, the, uh, one of the food products that is heavily, heavily GMO, and therefore it has lots of glyphosate on it if you buy it and it's not organic. So you should only eat organic soy and, it, and recommend that to your patients. And make sure it is unprocessed. So you don't want to eat soy pretending to be something else, like turkey, okay? Soy is what it is. So you want to have just miso, tofu, edamame. You do not want processed soy. Flax seeds and lignans are amazing. They can actually interact with the receptors that are estrogen receptors and actually help bacteria to flourish and help the gut to work properly. Even when you don't have the proper estrogen receptors, when you have these estrogen-like foods, they can actually do a lot of the same functions that estrogen would do. And in fact, these are actually protective for estrogen-related cancers like breast cancer and uterine cancer. So you have to realize that um, soy has been maligned, but it must be the healthiest type of soy. And by eating the right foods, there is this, like I mentioned, this beautiful synergy between estrogen and the microbiome that can help to regulate all of the metabolic features that are abnormal. So it's amazing that even though women with PCOS do have abnormal estrogen receptor functioning, but if you add these estrogen-like food products in moderation, you can actually have major beneficial effects. And we talked about probiotics, prebiotics. So I'm sure you all know what probiotics are. They're the live microorganisms that confer a benefit for the host. And the prebiotics, which are the food for the gut, bacteria. They're not food for you. And as you probably know, isn't it amazing? Like breast milk contains oligosaccharides, which humans cannot digest, but it's for the bacteria. It's to help create the microbiome of the baby. And we must continue by eating these prebiotic foods to help sustain and grow a healthy microbiota. And more than anything, women with PCOS need this to help restore their health. If you look here, if you eat very high fiber, the, the kind of resistant starch, the kind that, like the oligosaccharides, the only, the, only the bacteria can utilize these. Our, our own systems can't. But look at the benefits. You get improved appetite control, enhanced cognition. You get improved gut barrier function, of course, because you're producing more butyrate. You get reduced oxidative stress, reduced inflammation, and our bodies become better enabled. You get the xenobiotics can be better metabolized. You create a healthier estrabolome. The bacteria that can metabolize estrogen and pseudoestrogens become healthier. All of this with just the ingestion of resistant starch. Isn't that amazing? And here's just another quick slide to look at to show that when you eat the right foods, you get amazing benefits. I wanted to show that you can actually increase beta cell proliferation, regrowth of healthy beta cells in the pancreas. You can reduce T cell autoimmunity. You, you just have reduction of 
endotoxemia, all of this just by eating the right foods. There is no prescription drug that can do anything like this. So we have to eat a plant-based diet. In fact, agrarian diets have been shown when they've compared children in Africa with, East, with Western Europe who eat a more Western-style diet. The children who are eating the agrarian diets have much greater microbial diversity. So we start with a vegan diet. We want to also use omega-3 supplementation. We don't need a lot of protein from animals. In fact, that's I prefer none. And we don't have to push the, the protein at all. What we want to focus on is nourishing our gut microbiome. So we want to have high complex carbohydrates. Of course, no simple carbohydrates, no processed carbohydrates. We don't want to have a lot of fructose. So we do want to have fruit, but we don't want to eat more than a couple of fruit a day. We'd love for you to tell your patients to encourage them to eat about five to six cups of vegetables a day, all varied, and about half of them should be raw. So you get all of the wonderful, wonderful enzymes. By the way, as a quick note, when you eat cruciferous vegetables, have your patients cut them up and let them stand for 30 to 45 minutes. That will help release the sulforaphanes that are so critical for detoxification pathways. So you want to eat these wonderful foods and make sure you include a lot of fermented foods as well. And this is for a few months, like maybe um, six months and then you can slowly start reintroducing animal products. I'm not in favor of long-term vegan diets, but short-term it's the fast track to fixing the gut microbiome. And remember that the gut microbiome is not good at processing animal proteins. They make those toxic things like TMAO and nitrosyl amides until they get fixed. So when you do this kind of diet, like I said, in just one month you can have all these metabolic parameters improved. It's like beyond amazing. And your PCOS patients will start to see their skin clear up. Their weight will come down. I don't emphasize weight reduction. I say that will come. Let's work on health. The weight will come later as the health and the microbiome are restored. So here is wonderful. By the way, that white is organic homemade almond milk. There's kimchi. There's um, pine nuts and spinach. And there's a little bit of quinoa. And some hummus. That looks delicious to me. So you don't want to eat a lot of saturated fat. And look at this. Because this is such an anti-inflammatory diet, you really only need a ratio of omega-6 to 3 of about 5 to 1. You don't need that 1 to 1 because this is so anti-inflammatory. You're just doing amazing things for your body this way. And fats are very important. By the way, um, I have to mention I'm very against a ketogenic diet for long term. I don't even get into it except for very special populations because it actually can alter the gut microbiome in unhealthy ways. And people who came up with that originally did not understand the gut microbiome. But there are some special populations like um, people with dementia, sometimes that can help in the beginning, people who have malability um, of transporting glucose into the brain, and so forth. But they're very small numbers of people that really need to be on a true ketogenic diet. So, and we know that the types of fat you eat can affect your microbiome. Fish oil increases the good guys, the lactobacillus, the archimansia, and lard actually increases some other forms that are not so, not so optimal. This is just once again to show that diet restriction is often recommended, but if you eat a high um, resistant starch diet, you get all the same benefits and you get to eat. You can eat a lot. No one should ever go hungry. I don't believe in that. No one should be starving. So you want to eat tremendous diversity and diversity is so key to having a diverse microbiome. So you don't want to just eat broccoli. You want to eat across the rainbow of nutrients, of polyphenols, phytonutrients, all the different vegetables. With more diversity of diet comes more diversity of bacteria. It's like a dance. Each polyphenol has its own favorite bacteria and they get together creating these metabolic um, metabolites which then go and create all these amazing results in the body. And just a little bit goes a long way. It's amazing what these polyphenols can do. So it's, they actually amplify cell signaling pathways. They improve metabolic performance. So these vitamins, 
these nutrients, everything that comes from eating these wonderful, diverse vegetables and fruits can change the course of life for your PCOS patients. And once again, I mentioned ketogenic diets will diminish total levels of gut microbiota and actually change the microbiome. And high protein diets that are, you know, sometimes advocated for weight loss will often give you weight loss, but they actually increase the wrong types of bacteria over the long haul and increase the risk of disease in the GI tract. So I am not in favor of ketogenic diets or in favor of high protein diets. And timing is very important. They've actually done studies out of Israel that showed that if you eat two-thirds of your calories for breakfast, if you then eat just maybe one-third for lunch and just a teeny bit for dinner, in just one month, you can have your testosterone and insulin levels. How is that for amazing results? So when you eat matters. And having a lot of snacks is very bad. I encourage my patients to only eat no more than three meals a day. Now, in the beginning, they may have very dysregulated ability to burn fat. They're, they're really in trouble. They don't know how to burn fat. Their bodies are great at storing fat, but not at using fat. So they need snacks sometimes because they get so famished because their brains are starving for energy because they can't convert to burning fat. So in that case, I say eat a snack, but make it a fat snack, like a few macadamia nuts, some coconut oil, um, some olives. So how do I test my patients? I love the GI effects test. I can't even imagine living without it. Um, I get it on all of my PCOS patients because not only does it show me what's going on in their gut microbiota, with their gut microbiota, but it also helps to educate the patients on the importance of eating the proper diet as their therapeutic plan. So we can learn just from the front cover page. I love that page. You can see what the, the state of inflammation, infection, what they're lacking, and what kind of imbalances. You can actually see if they have too little short-chain fatty acid production, too little butyrate. You can see what's going on if they're having um, eosinophilic problems, if their calprotectin is elevated, if they have inflammatory bowel disease going on, what's growing. This gives you a wonderful overview of what's going on in their gut microbiome. You can actually see if they're making enough digestive enzymes. Women with PCOS often do not make enough stomach acid, enough digestive enzymes, because these are all dependent on proper estrogen signaling, by the way. So this gives you an idea of what's going on with the function of their, their pancreas in terms of producing digestive enzymes. And if they're digesting and properly absorbing their fats, because if they're putting out a lot of protein or fat with their stool, then obviously they're having problems with digestion. And so this gives me a wonderful view of what's going on in that department as well. And here looking at you know, calprotectin, which can give you a clue as to whether they have inflammatory bowel disease, and the eosinophil protein X, which gives you a good overview of whether they have different food allergies or possibly have some other form of parasite or worm or something growing in them. And the fecal secretory IgA, which gives you clues about the functioning of the immune system. The IgA is the most prevalent of all the immunoglobulins, and it's produced by the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. So this gives you a wonderful view as to what's going on with the immune system and the gut. As well, as I mentioned very briefly, the astrabolome. There are bacteria within the intestinal tract that are specifically designed to detoxify estrogen. And you can actually look at some of what's going on. Beta-glucuronidase is an enzyme which, if produced in too high quantities, can actually cause a recycling, enteropathic recirculation of toxic estrogen metabolites. But you, you want to have some. You want to balance. But if you need to, if you have very high levels of beta-glucuronidase while you're getting the gut microbiome organized and properly reinstated, you can give calcium deglucurate, which helps to block the action of this enzyme. 
and you can get um, a view by getting the estrogen detoxification pathways test to see exactly how your patient is metabolizing their estrogens. So this is something that you can follow to see how you're progressing with the health of your liver, where of course estrogen goes through a phase one and phase two detoxification process, and the gut microbiome, where you have the estrabolome, which further works on detoxification of estrogen. So this can be also wonderful clues to what's going on in your patient's body and helping to follow how you're making progress. So wrapping it all up, what are you going to do tomorrow or even today when your next patient with PCOS comes in? What are you going to do to help her to have optimal hormonal health and metabolic homeostasis? You're going to try to get her to eat fewer meals and no snacks. You're going to try to get her to do some periodic fasting, which obviously I don't have time to go into, but if a person doesn't eat for about four days, or you can do um, sort of a, a pseudo fast where you do um, low amounts of calories for a few days, you can actually trigger a lot of restorative processes in the body. Have them eat from locally grown foods and try to get heritage seeds, the old fashioned. Home cooking is where it's at. Don't use, of course, refined oils, which are very toxic. They're, they're just full of oxidation. And not to drink alcohol because that's a direct toxin to the gut. Avoid foods that are known to be inflammatory. Consider an elimination diet. Avoid foods that have GMO, things like glyphosate. You, and don't buy food in plastic. Don't buy food that has labels on it that of all kinds of chemicals. Those are not tested. Those are unhealthy. And we now know those are usually poisons to our gut microbiota. And do eat some phytoestrogens, but it must be organic, whole, soy, flax seeds, and such. Organic is the way to go. I know none of us can eat all organic, and neither can our patients, but emphasize it's worth it. Buy everything organic. Avoid artificial sweeteners. They're poisons to the gut microbiota. Stay away from gluten and dairy, or at least dramatically reduce it, okay? And stay away from wheat. It's all grown now with covered with glyphosate before it's harvested. Emphasize high fiber, resistant starch, eating across the colors of the rainbow, lots of fruits and vegetables, five to six cups a day, non-processed, cut it up, eat everything in the natural state, eat lots of raw foods, and avoid, like I said, non-GMO. Rather, you should eat, do not eat GMO. Avoid anything with Roundup and glyphosate, please. So you now have the tools, and your patients can easily access the tools so that the next time down the road when that 22-year-old young woman looks in the mirror and she sees her reflection, she will smile and you will be responsible for helping her to have the wonderful life that she deserves. And thank you so much for joining me here today. And I hope that you will go out and write lots of prescriptions of food. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Gersh. That was just a terrific presentation, and uh, we've already received a lot of good feedback, and I just want to remind everyone that the PowerPoint will be available on our website in PDF format next week. Uh, we did receive quite a few clinical questions, and uh, so if you don't mind, I'll we'll just start with, uh, we, we had a lot of questions around high fiber diets in our PCOS patients that have uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and exacerbations that, that might come from that. So any recommendations around how to introduce uh, more fiber in those patients? Absolutely. Um, that is a very big topic, you know, which I didn't obviously have time to cover. But if you give lots of fiber and your patient gets lots of bloating, then absolutely that is a very, uh, very powerful sign that your patient has small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And that does need to be addressed because otherwise, if you give a lot of probiotics, if you give a lot of fiber, you're going to be stimulating the growth in the small intestine. So we actually have a whole protocol in, in my office for treating that. But basically, you have to avoid a lot of these fibers. It's a delicate balance. It's really a, a, a condition that never used to exist. Now it's, of course, epidemic because of you know the antibiotics and the, the drugs that lower 
stomach acid. I mean, you must make sure your patients, all of your patients, PCOS and otherwise, are not on PPIs, do not use a lot of antacids, because when you don't have stomach acid, you can't control the overgrowth of bacteria. As well, when people are using laxatives or they don't eat enough fiber, they often, or their women, by the way, on oral contraceptives will often have abnormal gut um, peristalsis because estrogen is different when you're on birth control pills. That's another whole giant topic. But so when you get the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you have to really restrict short term. It could be a couple of months, a lot of the fibers, and you can give, you know, you want to restrict the polyols, the fructans, and so on, the oligosaccharides, because these will grow at, and you, we, there are, like, I'd love to do, maybe in the future, we could do a whole thing on small intestinal bowel overgrowth, but you have to restrict, and some people use the FODMAP diet, some people use the specific carbohydrate diet, you can also use an elemental diet, where you basically are just giving um, dextrose, and you're giving um, the uh, fatty acids, you know, like the um, medium chain triglycerides and amino acids just for a short period of time to basically give survival nutrition while you're starving out the bacteria. Of course, you're starving the bacteria in the colon too, so it's a delicate balance. So basically, the FODMAP diet, the specific carbohydrate diet, the elemental diets are the ones that you go to that you can try with your patients. Um, and you can, I often will use one and then switch to another. And then you give antimicrobials. So you can use blends of antimicrobials to try to also kill off the overgrowth of gut bacteria that are overgrowing in the small intestine. But absolutely, this has to be addressed. It's a very important point. And then once that is cleared up, then you can, you know, work as quickly as you can to restore the microbiome of the colon. But it's a delicate balance between killing bacteria and sustaining bacteria. So that is a, an excellent question and a very complex issue. Great. And uh, we also had a, a couple other questions on uh, your opinions around why not continue more long-term a vegan diet? Why, why introduce meat uh, back in? Well, that's another great question because and I know there are vegans out there, I'm sure, who say, you know, I think everyone should be a vegan. But there is data that there is some miraculous kind of miracle stuff that's in animal protein that actually works to build better bones and muscles. And I'm sure you've all seen vegans. Like vegans um, tend in general, I know this is a generalization, tend to be like thin, which is, I mean, it's good. They're, they're not, you hardly ever see um, of someone who eats a lot of vegetables and they're overweight, but they often don't have a lot of muscle. And we know that long term, having a really strong, vibrant musculoskeletal system is really essential to having a, a really healthy, long, what we call health span, so that you can you know, really be strong and do all the things that are required having a healthy musculoskeletal system. So we know that, for example, people who are older in their 60s and beyond, if they don't eat a higher amount of animal protein, they tend to have more sarcopenia. They lose muscle. So there's something that is in animal protein that seems to be really important for really growing the healthiest and strongest muscles. But you don't need a lot. I mean, people eat so much more animal protein than they need. It's really not necessary to eat more than just, you know, a, a few very few ounces of animal protein. It depends on your goal. If you're a weight builder and you're looking to build giant muscles, then of course you would want to eat a lot of animal protein. But in general, people who do that do not actually tend to have the longest, healthiest lives, but they do have big muscles. So you want to sort of balance it. To have the healthiest musculoskeletal system, you want to eat some animal protein. Also, I mean, that's why you don't typically don't get enough vitamin B12 if, and, and iron if you only eat vegetables. Humans were designed not as um, veg vegans. They're really designed to be omnivores. So I kind of, my whole philosophy is humans should live the way they're created to live. And that does mean eating some animal protein. Great. I know I set you up for two really big questions and topics there. Uh, and thanks for, for answering those to, to with the short time span. But uh, in the interest of time, I just going to end the question and answer period there. Um, for additional educational materials, we'd like to encourage you to visit our website, www.gdx.net. Uh, on the site, you'll find sample reports, kit instructions, and other information for all our profiles. 
And after taking advantage of the materials found on the website, feel free to contact client services with your questions. Uh, you'll see a number on the slide for US and UK customer service. And additionally, please call client services if you need assistance in setting up a MyGDX account. We also offer complimentary appointments with our medical education specialist to answer questions related to our testing, including choosing the right test and reviewing patient test results. And finally, uh, we'd like to encourage you to look for upcoming webinars on www.gdx.net. Next month, we will have Dr. Aviva Ram presenting on the adrenal thyroid connection, what's your body trying to tell you? And uh, thanks again, Dr. Gersh. Uh, thanks a lot for such a superb presentation. Oh, my pleasure. And good luck to every one of you in doing the right thing for your patients every day. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.